Michigan. Mm-hmm. Lynn, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. How's it going? Um, it's going okay. Cool, cool. Well, what did you want to talk to us about? Well, it's, it says here that you created your own religion, Lynnism. Well, you, you, yeah, it's kind of a, it's kind of half jokey. Okay. 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 I've, <laughs> I've been a, an atheist since I was a teenager. Okay. And I'm nearly 70 now. Uh, with some side trips into woo and new agey stuff. But anyway, my religion, if you want to call it that, has uh, a mess, it has a silly rule, and it has an ethic. The only serious part is the ethics. Okay. Okay, yeah, uh, just tell us a little bit more about that, I guess. Okay, well, the myth is, um, before we were born, I'm assuming everybody, I'm just like, before we were born, we were in a place where our every witch wish was granted all the time. All you had to do is think of it, and it happened. Okay. Okay. And there's and there's probably uh, you could call them people out there still in that kind of wishy world. But some of us got bored with that and said, "I wish everything didn't happen when I wished for it," and that's why we're here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So um, just to clarify, I, this yeah. is, is this something you actually believe or is this just a joke kind of thing? Like, No, it's kind, it's kind of jokey, except it's, it's sort of um, like when, when life gets really hard, I think of it. Mm, like, okay. Okay. So it's this a is an, this is another experience. <laughs> yeah. You know? So it's kind of a belief that gives you comfort when you think about it. Yeah, kind uh, of. Okay. But as far as I'm not as, sure I would call it a, a I, I wouldn't it, it's not like a belief, like I really believe this. Okay. It's just kind of a, a narrative that kind of helps you get through the day sometimes. It's yeah, it's a story. Okay. So is that is the the comfort from that the sort of idea that um that things aren't working out for you in in one way or another because they're not necessarily required to, as opposed to there yeah, being some kinda. sort of thing you've done wrong and like a plan that you it's, failed or something. No, no, it's more like, well, if if things really were perfect, I would be totally bored. That makes sense. So let's just uh, roll take with the punches. This, whatever's happening <laughs> for what it is. Yeah. Cool. That makes sense. Okay. Mm. Well, was there any okay. any other parts to this religion that you had, or was yeah, that? I think she had two more parts. Okay. okay. The the other part is is a silly rule that really only applies to me, <laughs> and that is, um, don't eat anything with more than two legs or less than uh, more than four legs or less than two. Okay. Anything more than so two? So it applies to. So only eat four-legged things, basically, unless there's a three-legged thing out there. Yeah, well, I've never encountered a three-legged thing, so... Um, <laughs> could be. Could be. I mean, uh, three, so, I've seen three-legged so dogs. Like, yeah, three-legged I guess that dogs counts. Is what I yeah. Do. yeah. <laughs> so I don't, I don't like fish, so that gives me an excuse not to eat fish. I okay, see. okay. So a dietary... Okay. And your your like, religion has a dietary I mean, restriction, is what it sounds like. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and so, like, I don't like... I don't like seafood and um, uh, right. like shrimp have like a whole bunch that of sort of thing. So <laughs> that's like that. Okay. Uh, what's, anyway, what's the final that's component? Silly, that's a silly rule. What's the final component to your religion? Um, the, the ethical part is um, four principles. They're not rules, but they're things that I try to accomplish every day or try to live by every day. Um, one is, the first one is honesty. The second one is empathy. The third one, creativity. And, <laughs> creativity and curiosity. Okay. And, yeah. Cool. I support that. <laughs> Yeah. So, did you did you were you calling just to kind of spread 
Leninism. Well, I think that, well, Lenin, oh, that's probably not the best. Well, Lin, uh, Lenin's uh, word for it. The ethical part, I'd, I'd yeah. like to see more people do. Yeah. Yeah. Have, have you uh, have you looked up the um, the tenets of the Satanic Temple? Satanic Temple. No, I really don't know much about that. Yeah, I've that's a thing. Heard of it, but it is. Uh, they have. I think they're ten. Uh, yeah, I'm ten not... like moral tenets of the Satanic Temple, and I don't have them in front of me, but um, but it's it's basically secular humanism and uh, and some much more sound moral codes than you would find in the Ten Commandments. So let me let me try to because this is a show where I like to ask questions about people's beliefs. So uh, mm-hmm. the first question that I ask probably I'm most interested in, I guess, is this kind of moral theory that you've presented to us, these kind of moral principles, I guess. Um, you've chosen specific principles. I mean, out of a list of principles, you've you've narrowed it down to a list of five or six or so. I don't remember. So, like, what four. is the criteria? It's four. Just four of them. Okay. So, like, what is the criteria you had when choosing these principles? Um, hmm. Uh... Criteria. I'm, I'm. I'm not sure how to answer that. Okay. Um, or really, just so, how, uh, how did if you? I can give you a, how did if, you come to narrow it down can, to yeah. those specific four and yeah, why if those four? I can four? give you a, a little bit of history on it. Okay. When yeah. I go ahead. When I was a teenager, when I was a teenager, I was very big into Ayn Rand objectivism mm. kind of stuff, and. I mean, really, really big into it. Read all of all of the stuff I could get a hold of. I subscribed to her magazine. I mean, I was like total brand head. Really? Interesting. And, and when I when when Rand and and uh, Nathaniel Brandon broke up, I would subscribe to their magazine at that time and they had a a big, I mean, it was a really big blow up. I think this happened in like 1965, something along that line. Mm -hmm. And it was totally traumatic to me. It was like, it was almost, I think of it as, it was like almost my parents having a messy divorce. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I really took a whole different look at the whole philosophy. Of objectivism, you mean? Of objectivism. Yeah, yeah. So for those of you, I just want to inform the viewers who aren't aware of what you're talking about. uh, There was a, uh, you know, some people debate whether she was, was, but a philosopher uh, named Ayn Rand who um, came up with this philosophy of objectivism um, that she kind of wrote about and in themes of her books like Atlas Shrugged and stuff. Some of you may have heard of that book or there's a movie adaptation of it, I believe, um, who kind of gave a way of... It was simultaneously a moral theory and also kind of an economic theory. It was kind of a lot of different things pushed into one. And there was a movement of people back in the 60s or so and and onwards of people who kind of followed this philosophy. I think I'm kind of giving the history, right? And and you identified as one of these people. Yeah, that's... Yeah. Yeah, I did. Um, But I was was not... I mean, I couldn't be physically part of it. I was, I was a teenager. I was at home. I was in Illinois, not New York, you know? And, um, anyway, when I, when I reevaluated it, I rejected mm, going on into my twenties. I continued kind of thinking about this and, um, I reevaluated the whole economic part and did a, did a 180 on that and became very liberal and very um, uh, Democrat, mm-hmm. and and that's what I've been on on that thing ever since. So you but discovered I did, what was your? I'm I'm curious what your method was for kind of discovering that objectivism wasn't true in your eyes. Well, I figured out that, and this is no great, no great insight, I don't think, but I figured out that number one, um, there's no such thing as a total individual, Mm -hmm. okay? Nobody stands on their own. Yeah. Nobody grows up without without help from somebody somewhere, at least parents, 
you know. Yeah. So and just... nobody nobody could live on their own on a desert island and have a life. Mm-hmm. So that, I don't care. John Galt or Ayn Rand or any of those, this, you know, you couldn't do it. Yeah. <laughs> you would not be a human being by yourself. Yeah. So, so I'm just, I want to clarify and, for the audience who isn't aware of some of these principles you're talking about. I know that Ayn Rand kind of talks about this idea of the, in, I, I'm not sure the phrase you use, but basically the individual self is like the, the primary thing you should be concerned about the most. Uh, and that everything in your actions should be helping yourself in some way, um, and and that kind of plays into that moral and also economic right. philosophy we were talking about. And you kind of understood that this yeah, was and and every everybody's responsible for themselves. That, that there should be no social, no social, uh, social any kind of socialism, any kind of altruism. Yeah, is yeah. bad. That was yeah. That should not. Do it. That was my understanding of yeah what she wrote. Um, so okay, so you so you went from believing in this individual self as the you know primary thing you should care about to going kind of the opposite direction and saying that no, you actually believe in kind of um, social welfare systems, maybe um, these kinds of systems of governance that actually do help people, maybe are a bit more altruistic in some sense. Um, and yeah, at, at least at least to a degree, and and the older I've gotten, the the more I think that way. And I'm um, my my curi- my mind goes straight to I just I want to know why. Like you, because Courtney and I, I know we've talked to people who are so intent on their beliefs, and then eventually someday they just go the other way, and yeah. they can cite different reasons for that. Some it sounds like you kind of had a bit of disillusionment maybe in your philosophy, and like I. You know, my brain immediately wants to go to, okay, well, what were the turning forces that kind of brought you away from that? Was it just you saw the philosophy in action and you didn't think that it, um, you know, it, it went through with it? You thought there were, like, flaws with it? Can you can you give me kind of, like, a breakdown of, of what your mind okay. went through? Um, the flaws in it. Uh, well, I, re- I, I saw more and more, and... This is on a on a personal level. I saw more and more how much we need other people, and how how little. Um, let's see, I'm how to say this right. Uh, just how much how much people need people, how much commu- how important community is, mm-hmm. and and you know just just that you can't live alone. <laughs> I mean. I live alone. I live in an apartment, but I live in a society that, you know, gives me clean water and electricity and education yeah. and, you know, all of that stuff that, that you know, I didn't create. Yeah, you know? okay. So if you, so your mind was kind of convinced by you, you didn't see this philosophy kind of in action. So if you wanted to know if objectivism was true, like if you if you had to find a method of figuring out whether it was true or not, you'd probably have to find somebody who could work with the philosophy and truly be like an individual. But you're kind of saying that doesn't actually happen, like people don't really operate that way. Is that right? I don't think there is such a person. Mm. Mm. Okay. Because even though there are people that think they may be, you know, total individuals, um, and are you know totally self-made person? Um, they're forgetting that that person had they had a society behind them. They had schooling. They had education. They had parents. They had you know mm-hmm. society gave them a whole lot before they started out on their own. So are you talking about sort of a um, a tabula rasa kind of thing where people are uh, sort of blank slates and then they're uh, shaped by the culture around them? Um, to a degree, I wouldn't say totally blank right. slates. I think we start out with, with some things, but not not enough. I mean, if you... It, it, I mean, you look at, um, oh, the children in Romanian orphanages and, you know, what, what happened to them. I mean, 
or or uh, feral children who are you know grow up in the in the woods somewhere. Right. You know, they're they're barely human. You know, mm. they can't function. Yeah, I've seen uh, yeah. uh, at least one documentary on this. Uh, these kind of feral children that kind of grow up for some, some period of time without any human contact at all, um, and they can't speak languages. Like they seem to be able to. Um, be kind of slowed down in their learning processes in some way, and yeah. it's it's uh, scary to think of what that experience must be like to be completely by yourself. So, yeah, I, I think that's a great example actually of somebody kind of being completely on their own and what that does to somebody. It's, it doesn't seem very healthy. Yeah, there is a a, um, a window of opportunity in terms of learning, especially language ability, um, and yeah. we learned that from some really unfortunate cases, including uh, what was called the Jean case, which was a young lady yeah, n- named Jeannie. Jean. Yeah, um, so yeah. she, for those who don't know, she um, was raised sort of in a cage, uh, and she was never spoken to. She uh, was no, never she potty was, trained. She was isolated in a bedroom in the right. dark, and, and sort of her like father forbade confined, anyone yeah. from talking to her until she was she was like. 13 when she was found. Yeah, and then I, and I believe she died at she, 24? I I don't know what ultimately happened to her. Um, so she, she didn't yeah, have but the... She was, she, was a, she was a very bright child, mm. and when she was rescued, um, she was brought, you know, out of the situation. She learned all... She learned words like crazy. I mean, she, she just learned... Ended up with a pretty big vocabulary. Mm. But no grammar, right? Well, th- so she could not really communicate. And from from what I understand from the case study, there were a lot of limits to her learning ability. Um, that there are certain yeah. windows of opportunity in age uh, where you're able to develop um, fluency in a in a uh, in a language. Um, so that was a very interesting uh, case that was yeah. very unfortunate. And and um, in in situations like that, it, you'd prefer it not to happen to anyone, but uh, we do learn from it. Um, and, you know, obviously not an endorsement, but um, but yeah. what was sad about that was that there there was a limitation in that, and, and that's part of why we know uh, that there are limitations to, um, to development when your environment is developmentally stunted. Um, so that, that does play a major role in... in the trajectory of a person when uh, when they're given um, kind of proper nourishment and encouragement and all of those things. Right. Yep, for sure. And anyway, in, in general, we, you know, nobody, nobody can really raise themselves. No man is an you island. Be part of a society. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. I get that. Well, Lynn, your religion sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> uh, I like it so far. It sounds very altruistic. Sounds very nice. Sounds, um, Sounds better than what you had before, you know. Um, it sounds like you're happy about it too. So that's that's always good to hear. I'm I'm pretty good with it, but just just one question. Okay, I'd like to ask your audience or anybody that cares about it. Has anyone? I'm not sure if I the myth part about being living, you know, in a place with no with no limits, with just every wish granted. I'm not sure if I made that up. Or if I heard it somewhere. I don't know. I, it I, is amazing how often that happens where we're like, did I make this up in my head? Or yeah. <laughs> have I heard it? Yeah. I don't think I've heard it before. I have. But, it, uh, it did sound like um, the uh, children of the corn kind of thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I can see you can say that, yeah. <laughs> um, it sounded, well, there was a, there was a Twilight Zone uh, in the original series uh, around the 50s where there was a child who, if they didn't, it was kind of the opposite. If they didn't like something, they could wish it. Out oh, of, yeah, yeah. The, yeah. Wish them to the cornfield. To the cornfield, yeah. yeah. And I and uh, so that was an interesting, I thought of that when you mentioned it. Um, but it's, it's interesting how much we uh, sort of take popular culture as much as uh, previous religious beliefs. And you see that with... Um, personal accounts of UFOs and things, um, what what people claim yeah. to see 
uh, based on their their therapy they've gone through and and trying to like recount what they've seen uh, usually is very similar to what people have popularly seen in movies. Um, and so it's, yeah. it's well, incredible I know I how, did like, see that what we Twilight know is, Zone as a child, so. Yeah, yeah, maybe so. I did see that Twilight Zone as a child, so. Isn't, I did that, that, too. <laughs> Isn't that interesting how our memory can affect us in ways that we don't even consciously realize? Um, if that's yeah. the case with your religious exactly. belief, I, I can't confirm it whether you stole that from somewhere or not, but I think that is interesting, probably something to look into. Yeah, that's an sure. interesting thing about, about creativity, too. Things like uh, music, when... Um, it's impossible to separate your own inspiration and creativity from your previous influences of music. You know, it's mm -hmm. impossible to completely separate yeah. it and be completely original, um, which, you know, you, you don't necessarily need to be the most original thing in the world. But um, but it is interesting how, you know, how that works and how we're we are unable to separate the influences around us. Uh, whether it's media and and not even know what's influencing us, but it still does. You know, it's still kind of subconsciously affecting our our ideas and our decisions and our creativity. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, sometimes yeah. the secular world even influences religion. If you can believe it, Ooh, some people yes. don't, some people don't well, say that, but it, well, I, I, I would absolutely true. say that. What was yeah. that? I, I didn't. What was what was that? I didn't hear that. Well, there's this idea in a lot of religious cultures that say that we need to be separate from the separate the secular world and that religion kind of stays in its own world but oftentimes those two things mix mm -hmm. more so than some people like to oh. admit and i think a lot of religious ideas that we have now are actually quite modern inventions right. um, that didn't always exist from the source material well and especially the the oh. morality you know the the, oh, the, yeah. the, well, the moral stances sure, our, have yeah they've progressed because of secular society for, having an influence sure. on religion. yeah well Lynn, religions religions have changed yeah, <laughs> right I yeah. think so too but because I, we value community that's and true. being accepted that is so so true but I think we're gonna go ahead and try to wrap up the show for tonight thank you Lynn for calling that was a really interesting okay. conversation and again I, I like yeah. I like your religion I think you should spread it so keep, <laughs> keep up the good word spread it okay all right I'll I'll um, <laughs> I'll have to to send some some uh, what do you call it? some disciples out to process. <laughs> yeah, sure thing. We'll see yeah. if it looks the same two thousand years from now. Um, but uh, we'll, yeah. we'll get back to you on that. Okay, you have a great night. Okay, bye bye. Yeah, yeah, really.